Good morning to each of you. Thank you for being here this morning. We have a wonderful crowd assembled. I know there are a good number that are listening online and watching our video stream. Uh, you heard in our opening prayer as Brother Brian led us, uh, asking God to bless many who are dealing with sickness and sorrow and various other difficulties. And we do pray for all of you and those of you that are in those situations know that we miss you very much and pray that things can be better very soon in your life and that you can return to be with us in person. To those of you that are visiting, thank you for being here. We pray you will give us the opportunity to get to know you a little better. I know some are traveling through on to your next destination, whether that be a vacation spot or maybe from vacation headed back toward home. We wish you safety. We pray your uh, God's safety for you and for the opportunity that you might have the next time you're in our area, stop and see us again. We'd be delighted for you to do so. Back to school time. We've said that every Sunday this month, and I think I've covered roughly everybody. Now, if you're studying something that I've not addressed, uh, please feel free to let me know. I'm not trying to overlook. There are some obscure things that you can study now. If you have the right website and the right amount of money you can send and you can get a diploma or a certification in almost any sort of thing uh, if you want to impress people by doing that. So that may be what you're doing. And if so, we wish you well in your studies, but certainly for our elementary and middle school and high schoolers and college and university and trade school and uh, technical school, all of those uh, people associated with uh, that enterprise, whether as students or teachers or whatever, we pray God's blessings on you and that this year, the remainder of it will be a wonderful one indeed. We've been talking about choices. You know, sometimes choices, bad choices, they become quite evident quite quickly. Uh, like when your foot becomes a little too heavy on the accelerator, on the gas pedal, uh, sometimes your choice, your bad choice, uh, you're made aware of it. Uh, rather rapidly when the blue lights or the blue and the red lights appear in your rear view mirror. I remember I was, I guess, 16 or 17. Uh, I might have been, I might have been 15. I don't remember driving. I, I was riding uh, with my dad over to Sparta to speak at the Robert Street Church of Christ uh, because he had a co-worker that worshiped there who was a member and the brethren at Robert Street are predominantly African-American. It was going to be my first time to preach, and I don't like the term white church, black church, but that's kind of how we use those terms, you know. And I was going to be preaching on Joel 3.14. In Joel 3.14, Joel tells the people of God, as well as the enemies of God, this ominous warning, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord draws near in the valley of decision. Now that idea from the prophet Joel was, for those people in that day, it's certainly applicable today just like it was those many years ago when I was a teenager. It's time now to consider that there is coming a day in which God will deal with each person who has ever lived. And how He will deal with us will be based on the choices that we make. So every day we live life, as it were, in this valley of decision. And I was still thinking about how would I introduce that lesson? And it just so happened as we were driving down Highway 111 from Cookville to Sparta, uh, you know if you've taken that straight stretch, it's very easy just to go a little faster than the posted speed limit. And sure enough, someone in front of us had done that. And I can't remember if it was a Putnam County Sheriff's Deputy or a White County Sheriff's Deputy or maybe one of our local Tennessee Highway Patrol uh, patrolmen had pulled this person over and the blue lights were flashing. And so I got up and uh, I began with that illustration. And I said, somebody made a bad choice. And one of our good black brethren said, that's right. And um, that just kind of shocked me because that's kind of their culture, you know, to participate in the sermon. I said, have you ever made a bad choice? Mm -hmm. You know, and then I spent longer. I spent about 30 minutes talking about this guy that got pulled over on 111. And had very little time to actually do my lesson. I don't want to do that this morning. That's just to show you that choices have consequences. And we've been in Philippians chapter 4. And I invite you to go to that chapter this morning. We've looked at verses 4 to 13. And we're going to conclude that series this morning by looking at verses 10 to 13. Where Paul said there's a choice that we need to make. And that choice in verses 10 to 13 is this. We need to choose to learn the secret. Choose to learn the secret. What, what are you talking about? Well, let's read the passage in its entirety as we've done every Sunday morning. We'll review briefly and then look at these verses in particular. Paul said, beginning in verse 4, Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice 
in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren... Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. The God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Choose to learn the secret. Verse 10 is a transition verse. Paul is just telling the Christians there, I appreciate the way you've helped me and supported me. Remember that he is imprisoned. We believe in Rome when he wrote this letter. And uh, with the conditions of Roman prisons, uh, probably an inadequate amount of food and other care would have been provided to Paul. But the Romans did seem to have or possess sufficient mercy that if you had a benefactor, as they might call them, or if you had someone that would send you aid, that aid could be given. And evidently, especially the Christians at Philippi, who Paul is writing in this book of Philippians 2, they had done that. And he'll continue to detail some of that information in the remainder of the chapter. But in verse 10, he said, your care has flourished again. You've helped me again. Uh, don't misunderstand, Paul said. I know you cared all along, but you just lack the opportunity. For whatever reason, he doesn't tell us exactly. But he said, I'm, I'm appreciative. And I'm thankful that you have helped me even in this time of my distress, even in this time of adversity. And yet... With verse 10 as that transition, beginning in verse 11, he said, But it's not because I have a need, or it's not because that I'm now able to confront and deal with the problems that I have because you have helped me, although I appreciate that help very much. No, it's rather that I've learned something. And he said, I've learned a secret. Now, we read this morning, um, my translation is the New King James Version. You may be reading that or one similar, and you may not see that word secret at all. However, you may be reading a translation uh, that says in verse number uh, 12 that Paul says, I have learned the secret or I have learned this idea, this, this concept. And while it's not there in every translation, the actual language that Paul uses does contain that term in the original language. Uh, mysterion. And that sounds a lot like the English word mystery, and for good reason. Because the word that's translated, sometimes mystery, sometimes here, as secret, or really as Paul says, I have learned uh, there in verse uh, number 12, it referred to the way that the Greek philosophy, the Greek, what they were even called mystery religions, would have all these secret sort of rituals and ceremonies. And uh, in order to become a member of those, you had to kind of be initiated into that particular group, whether it be uh, the cult of Zeus or Aphrodite. And you've heard some of those names if you've studied Greek mythology. And those who were in charge in power, they just kind of set up the rules as they went. And that made it very effective for them to hold on to power. Uh, because if you know the rules and nobody else does, uh, then you can control people by making them capitulate or to kind of do whatever you want them to do if they want to be a part of your group. Now, that is not the way Paul is using the word here. Christianity is not a set of made-up rules by any man. It's not something that we hold, uh, you know, close to our chest and say, okay, if you want to be a part of our group, here's what you have to do, and we make up the rules as we go. That's not what I'm trying to imply at all. Instead, the Bible is the will of God, the inspired Word of God. God has breathed out and given us His will in the Bible. And in the New Testament, you and I can take this objective truth and we can study it. 
We can learn it. We can read. We can grow. We can come to an understanding of what God wants us to do and then render obedience to it. And we are, enjoy, or we are enjoined all throughout it to do that very task. And you hear me repeatedly say that. And that's what we want you to do even this morning. If you're not living the way that the Word of God teaches, please hear it. Please listen. Please understand it. And please make a response to it, the response that God wants you to make. And still yet, uh, in this passage, Paul is saying he's learned a secret. Now, already in verses 4 and 5, we've talked about, Paul said, you can make a choice to rejoice. That's got a little rhythmic rhyme to it, doesn't it? Make a choice to rejoice. Now, life isn't always easy. You know that. Sometimes it's very challenging. But rejoice in the Lord. Do it always. Again, I'll keep saying it. Paul said, I'm repeating myself, but this is how important it is. Verse 4, rejoice. And if you do that, you can do that by being gentle. Let your gentleness, let your moderation, let your forbearance, let your tranquility be known to all people because the Lord is at hand. Whether that means He is near in proximity or whether that means spatially in time, His return will be soon. Our time on this earth is brief in comparison to eternity. We can rejoice and be calm if we keep that thought in mind. Again, it's not always easy in certain circumstances and we're aware, but Paul said, this is the choice that I put before you as the choice that the Christian should make. Doing that, verses 6 and 7, you will choose to pray and be the recipient of that peace instead of being anxious. And again, we have to acknowledge that sometimes life can be overwhelming. There are times when uh, we can become so consumed and almost spiral down because of the burdens that life places upon us. That's why we need to help each other. That's why uh, we need, for instance, in times of medical difficulties to seek uh, medical assistance and professional assistance, whether that's for physical or emotional or mental health. And even spiritually, life can be overwhelming sometimes. But Paul says, be anxious, but instead go to God in prayer. Anxious for nothing doesn't mean I'm never concerned, I'm never troubled, I'm never worried. Rather, it means that I never allow that to pull me away from God. I never allow that to separate me from God. Instead of pushing me farther from Him, it pushes me closer to my Savior, closer to my Heavenly Father. And so with thanksgiving, I make my request known to Him. And here's the promise He gives me when I do that. The peace of God, which is beyond understanding. Now, why make a statement like that? Well, Paul said, you can't create it. You can't even fully grasp it. But God gives it to you and it will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. If you're beginning to see a little bit of a pattern, then you're going in the right direction I want you to go to, even as we get to the verses for our consideration this morning. But let's keep going by way of review. In verse 8 and 9, we looked at last week, I have to choose to think right and act right. And this is a summation of the previous points as well. Why do you do what you do? Why do you act the way that you act? Why do you behave the way that you behave? A lot of us just say, well, that's just what I do. But the Bible tells us we act the way we think. And Jesus said, for instance, in Mark chapter 7, it's not what comes out of a man that defiles him in the sense of uh, eating stuff that is unclean or clean according to Jewish dietary laws. Rather, it was what was inside all along. Not what you ingest, but rather what is within, what you think about from out of the heart. And Jesus is using the heart there, the synonym for your mind and your will. That's where evil thoughts, that's where sin arises. And so by contrast, if I'm going to be what God wants me to be, here in verse 8, some things that I need to put my mind on. Let it be focused and dwell and meditate on true things, noble and honorable things, things that are pure and just and lovely of good report. Those are the things Paul said you've learned and received and heard and saw in me. I've tried to live my life in this way and... If you do that, here's what Paul says you will discover because I've discovered it to be true as well. And many of us have had the same realization. The God of peace will be with you. Now, if you are yet not sure of what this theme is that we're trying to explore, what this secret is, uh, let me just keep going. Paul said he had learned a secret. Now, you might in reading verses 11 to 12, where Paul said, I'm not speaking in regard to need. I've learned to be content. And then he says in verse 12, 
abased, abound, hungry, or full, I know how to be content. Now, what's interesting, you might say, well, contentment's the secret. That's what you're telling me, preacher. Learn to be content, right? Interestingly, in verse number 11, Paul said, I've learned to be content, but not in the way that you might think. What do we think of when we think of contentment? Do we think of this word, self-sufficiency? Most of us would say, no, I, I don't think that's right. I think you're confusing your terms here. It is true that contentment uh, can mean sometimes the idea of just being satisfied. If you turn in your Bibles just a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes to that young man Timothy in the last chapter, chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, and he says in verse 6, so 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, Paul says, makes the statement that of many of us are familiar with, he said, godliness, godliness is just their word that might encompass, leading the way that God would have us to live. In other words, simply put, it's being like God, and that's what God wants us to be and to do, to be like Him, to act like Him as much as we are able. So godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness, behaving as God would have us to, with contentment, being satisfied to do that, that's enough, brings great gain, a financial term actually. Why is that the case? Well, verse 7 is explanatory. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. All of us know the statement, uh, the truthfulness of this statement on both ends. As life begins, I have nothing. As life ends, I may have accumulated assets and wealth and other things, but as they place my body back into the ground or however they choose to make disposition, my loved ones, of my physical remains, I'll have no use for it. I'll, take, I'll not take that with me. And even if I did, it would have no value with me should it be in my casket along with my dead body. I brought nothing in. I'll carry nothing out. So verse 8, Paul says, having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Now just think about how radical that is in today's consumer-driven, commercial, uh, you know, society that we live in, where capitalism and the idea that more and more is always needed and necessary, it's in stark contrast. Food and clothing, you've got that, you've got enough, Paul said. And in the first century world, where these things were even much scarcer than they are today, uh, that would have made maybe more of an impact than it does on us. Food and clothing, we take those as givens. Well, of course, I've got food and clothing. Everybody's got food and clothing. Not everybody, not everyone in the world, not everyone even in this country to a sufficient measure. But the idea, of course, is if I have enough of these, I should be satisfied. I should be content. I should be appreciative. If Paul be the writer of the book of Hebrews, we're not sure if he is or not. But if you turn to the last chapter in the book of Hebrews, the same idea is expressed where the Hebrew writer says in verse 5, let your conduct, in other words, let the way that you live be without covetousness. Now, covetousness is one of those old Bible words that we don't use a lot anymore in day-to-day -day conversation. But covetousness is just the idea of wanting more. Wanting more. And again, as I said a moment ago, isn't that exactly how our entire economy is set up? And the way the whole business world works, you need more. You need something new and improved no matter what it is. Last year's product, it might have worked last year, but this year you've got to buy something else. You've got to buy something more. You've got to buy something that's new and improved. That's the idea of covetousness, just wanting more. So he said, let your conduct be missing that, devoid of that type of insatiable desire. Rather... Be content with such things as you have. That's it. So when we think about contentment, we think of that typically. I'm thankful for what I have and I have enough and I'm just going to be satisfied with that. Whatever that is. If it's the type of automobile that I drive, if it's the home that I live in, if it's my wardrobe. If God has blessed me with these things, then I should be happy with that and not always wanting more. That is typically the way we use the word 
contentment. But back to Philippians chapter 4, if you'll turn back to that passage, that is not the word that Paul uses here at all, surprisingly. Even though the English translations that we read from end verse 11 with Paul saying, I have learned to be content. They could have better translated that, just my opinion, because the word that is used here is a word that means I have learned to rule myself. I've learned to rule myself. Now, what does it mean to rule yourself? Really, we're talking about self-sufficiency. Now, again, a word that equals self-sufficiency translated as contentment seems to be out of place, especially what we've read beginning in verse 4 and the choices that I've asked you to make. You might even say, well, hey, preacher, that idea of self-sufficiency, isn't that contrary and even contradictory to the message of Jesus? I believe I remember reading, and you do, you can turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It's still in your Bible where Jesus said, if any man will be my disciple, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, here's what you do, Jesus said, let him, let her deny himself. That's a big order. That's a tall command, Lord. Deny himself, deny herself, take up the cross daily and follow after me. That's what Jesus said. And so you may be scratching your head saying, now, how do we square these ideas? Jesus said, if you're going to follow him, you can't trust in yourself. You have to deny yourself. You have to put your own wishes and your own will secondary at least to his. And maybe even further down the line than just second. You have to take up that cross daily. The idea of taking up a cross uh, simply means sacrifice. And sacrifice, again, carries with it the idea by virtue of the definition of the word, I'm going to do something I don't want to do. I'm going to do something that God wants me to do instead. And yet, here we are in Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, I have learned to be self-sufficient. I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. Now, this idea of self-sufficiency before I pass on let me just say, and again, what I've echoed already, it's woven into the fabric of our nation, is it not? We like that rugged American individualism. We like the pioneer spirit. Uh, the people that live in this area, our ancestors, I know some of you, you, you don't have roots in this area like some of the rest of us do, but uh, a lot of us have roots in this area that go back generations. Crossing through the Cumberland Gap into the wilderness, making a living on these hillsides and scratching out, you know, just a subsistence living. They were can-do kind of people. And they had to be self-sufficient. Sam Walton hadn't built any Walmarts anywhere inside in the, you know, 17 and 1800s. They had to provide for their own needs. And that self-sufficiency, um, maybe if you're like me, you look back and say, boy, if I'd lived then, I may not have lived long you know, I don't know if I could have done that, if I could have had that same sort of can-do spirit that they did. Uh, you know, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. When I was in high school, there was an award given every graduation to one student, and it was called the Bootstrap Award. And I didn't really understand that till I got older. And then I realized there were some kids, some of my fellow classmates, who didn't have the advantages that I did, certainly as it came to a good family life and support and things of that nature. They really had to do it on their own. Just getting to school was a big chore for them. But we like that idea. I'm self-sufficient. But Paul said, I'm content because I have, verse 11, learned to be content in this way. Now, uh, I have learned. What, what, what does that very phrase imply? I think it implies that there was some information that he had somehow gained that he had not previously known. Isn't that right? Isn't that what learning is all about? We send our kids back to school in order for them to gain new information. Maybe like, you know, the uh, little boy that gets off the bus and he runs up the sidewalk and mom asks him after the first day of school, you know, how'd it go? And he said, not so well. And she said, I'm sorry, honey, what went wrong? And uh, he said, well, I have to go back again tomorrow. I didn't learn all I needed to learn today. You know, that's the idea. Sometimes we think it should come instantaneously. But Paul said, I have learned. Well, where did this learning come from? How was it accomplished? He said, not just in learning, but now I know. 
And that knowing that comes from learning came from the experiences described in verse 12, how to be abased, how to abound. And if you see in those the extremes of the spectrum or the highs and the lows, the mountains and the valleys, that's exactly what Paul is trying to get you to picture and see in your mind's eye. I know how to be full and I know how to be hungry and everywhere in between. I've learned both to abound and to suffer need. So wherever I am on the range of comfort or discomfort, of plenty or lack, I've learned. And now I know. Now it's true, you know, sometimes we typically, and I've been guilty of this, we think the hard times, those are the times that God means for us to learn something. When we face adversity, when we face hardship, when we face, uh, even if it might be persecution of whatever type, when we face a health struggle, when we face financial scarcity, we look at those times and we view them typically and we say, well, those are negative, but maybe God wants me to learn something. And that's true. I believe that he does. And we're going to see that momentarily. But notice Paul said, I know and I've learned also when I was full, when I abounded and when I uh, had everything that I needed. I learned something in those moments also. Do you and I maybe learn as much as we should in the good times of life? I wonder. Again, if you'll turn back to Hebrews chapter 5, there, there's a statement made in Hebrews 5 in verses 8 and 9 about Jesus that admittedly to me is very challenging. Those who have heard me preach from this pulpit know that one of my little shock statements that I like to use sometimes when we talk about the grandeur and the magnificence of God relates to His omniscience. And the statement that I make, and people always, you know, some people that are hearing it for the first time, you know, they kind of sit back and they say, well, what did He mean by that? Are, are you sure? Here's the statement. God has never learned anything. People say, well, wait a minute, that can't be right. But it is. God has never learned anything because He's always known everything. So He doesn't have to learn. He knows everything. And yet the Bible says, speaking about Jesus, who was God in the flesh, verse 8, though He was a son, yet He, notice the word, learned obedience by the things which He suffered. And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Somehow, some way, and you'll have to work it out in your mind philosophically, what the Hebrew writer is trying to communicate. I think I've got a general idea and understanding that Jesus can relate to us because of his earthly physical experiences in the flesh. Even though he was 100% man, 100% God, he learned obedience by what he suffered. When you think about his life and what he suffered, there's much to consider that time will not permit us to. But learning from his life, we must as humans do the same. Now, Paul has told us again, if you'll flip back to Philippians chapter 4, I know you're still wanting me to answer. How did he learn to be content? How could he learn self-sufficiency? What does he mean by that? He said it's because of what he knows. And he acted and behaved his life in a certain way so as to have learned this, as I mentioned earlier, secret. What he says in verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both. That word both there uh, is, again, just one word in the original language. It's usually translated into three or more into English. But it's the idea, I have learned the secret of being full and being hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. What is that secret? That secret is how he could be self-sufficient. How could he repeatedly tell these Philippians? And if you turn back to chapter 1, you'll see it as early... Uh, as the first few verses, when he tells them to rejoice. Over and over again, we have emphasized that idea, just as we did in Philippians 4, verse 4. To rejoice, to be joyful people. How do we tell people that? How are we able uh, to give them that sort of encouragement when life is not going as it should? How could Paul do that? How could he avoid complacency and apathy? How could he keep going even after they threw him into prison? He's writing letters trying to encourage Christians on the outside. How could he face setback after setback and disappointment after disappointment? How could he say, I'm self-sufficient and I can keep going? How could he learn a secret like that? 
The secret, of course, is, as most of you have already probably guessed, verse 13. It's not self-sufficiency at all. It's self-rule in the sense of my strength, verse 13, comes through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At the end of verse 11, when Paul said, I've learned to be self-sufficient, I think he said that for the shock value of it, especially for his original readers, and I hope it had maybe even the same impact on you this morning. Self-sufficient? They would have said, whoa, wait a minute. Everything you've told us has been about Jesus. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Verse 5, the Lord is at hand. Verse 6, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, the peace of God. Verse number 9, the God of peace will be with you. And then in verse 11, he said, I've learned to be self-sufficient. No, he's just telling you, I have learned where my true strength comes from. And now in verse 13, he kind of ties a nice bow on it, if you will, and says, Jesus what I've told you all along, I'm just telling you once again, I've learned the secret of self-sufficiency. It's not in me at all. It's entirely in Him. It's in Jesus. Now, the verb rendered here, I can do all things, is a verb of capability. It would be better rendered, I am strong in the one who gives me strength. That doesn't quite flow as smoothly in English, but that would be a way in which you could render this passage. Think about that in your own life as I do in mine. I am strong in the one who gives me strength. If I had to rely on my strength, I wouldn't have made it this far. I'll just go ahead and tell you. If you look back on your life, you think about the times that you've relied on your own strength. And I'm not to say that I've not done that. I've tried that before and I've failed miserably. But if it were not for the strength of God, if it were not for the strength of Christ, I could not have made it even to this point. Listen to Paul as he describes to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians, his second letter in our New Testaments to those Christians there. In chapters 12 and 13, he makes these impressive statements. In chapter 12, he writes to them and tells them something about what the Bible describes as a thorn in the flesh. All of us, well, I say all of us, most of us, you've had a thorn or some type of just, um, you know, other little unpleasant thing maybe lodge in your skin. I think back uh, growing up picking blackberries. Every once in a while, you'd get a blackberry briar stuck uh, and uh, maybe mom would have to dig it out with a needle or, uh, you know, you'd have to do some other measure. And it's just unpleasant. Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was, he said it was a messenger of Satan. That sounds very unpleasant. However, whatever you want to say that it was, uh, we have no details other than verse 7. Concerning though this, con this matter, Paul said it was so unpleasant, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. But here was God's answer. My grace, verse 9, is sufficient for you. For, here's the reason why, God speaking to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. It just seems almost counterintuitive, does it not? Strength and weakness, they don't go together. Oh, in the life of Paul, he said they most certainly do. And in your life as a Christian, they most certainly will, if we do as he did. Therefore, most gladly, Paul continues, I will rather boast in my infirmities... Infirmity is, again, the word that just speaks of those weaknesses. Those things that I look at as detriments or hindrances. I will boast in those, why, Paul? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For, now here's his explanatory reason. Here's where he puts it all together. He said, here's what I've learned. Here's the secret. When I am weak, then I am strong. And again, the world would read that or hear that, and they'd say, that's absolute nonsense. But Paul said, that's the secret. That's what self-sufficiency is. 
That's understanding where my power comes from. When I am weak, that is when I put myself and my resources and my abilities and my own pride and my own human saying, I can do it aside and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to humbly follow you. I'm going to let you take care of me. Then, and only then, can I be strong. It's the same opening in my Bible. You might have to turn the page to chapter 13. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4, I wish we had more time to even explore this. Time will not permit. But Paul, again, adds to the thought when he says, For though he, in the pronoun he, references Jesus, for though Jesus was crucified in weakness, and he was, because he possessed all power, but he allowed human beings to put him on a cross. He did that for your sins and mine. Yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are what? Weak in him. But we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. The next time you think you've got it figured out. The next time that you're thinking, you know, what am I going to do in this situation? And what resources am I going to call upon? Uh, how am I going to handle this? And all of us, as we face different matters in life, do that in different ways. Be sure that your self-sufficiency isn't just in yourself. Understand that the self-sufficiency that Paul describes in chapter 4 of the book of Philippians is that through Christ I can do all things. Now the all things there, I didn't say it, but I know you know or should realize we have to qualify. It doesn't mean I can climb to the top of this building and jump off and expect to fly as I quote Philippians 4.13. All I'm going to do is go splat on the pavement. It doesn't mean I can do that which is impossible. It means when life confronts me with whatever it is that it puts before me, whether that be from the hand of God or even from the hand of the evil one, the devil to tempt me to try to destroy me with Christ, I can get through it. Will there sometimes be struggle? Yes. Will there sometimes be setbacks? Absolutely. Will there be sometimes where it feels like I'm just stuck and can't even make a step? Sure. But if I hold on and if I keep trusting in Him, I will. John 15, verse 5. Here's how Jesus said it there, and the lesson will be yours. Talking about the analogy between a vine, which Jesus said He is the true vine, and we are the branches. As the vine, we depend upon Him. And He makes that statement very clear, unmistakably clear, when He says in verse 5, The one who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Now here's the phrase I want you to take home with you this afternoon. Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. It's not, we sometimes say, well, you know, life, when it gets hard, then I'll try Christianity. When my kids aren't behaving like they should, then, you know, maybe then we ought to start going to Bible study. Or when the job gets too stressful, maybe then I'll think about praying. Or when I'm in a time of sorrow, you know, maybe I should pick up and read my Bible. And we reserve it for those times only. Jesus said, you're sadly mistaken. Every single day, in every endeavor that you might undertake, without Him, you can do nothing. Oh, you might accomplish something. You might find success as the world defines it. You might even be uh, one who has been deceived both by yourself and by the devil that, you know, that whole Jesus stuff, you know, that's not really that big of a deal in my life. I've figured it out on my own. Please don't make that mistake. Please learn the secret. Learn the secret that Paul said he knew. That the secret was not in his own self-sufficiency, but that through Christ, he is the one who gives me strength. For without him, I can do nothing. Secrets, they've always been fascinating uh, to us. Uh, I'm not much of a movie buff, but I saw the advertisements uh, the last few weeks about the uh, movie about Robert Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project. Some of you, you know much better than I do. Your family... You lived the Oak Ridge experience and also other places, of course, where that, um, you know, that great weapon of destruction was uh, constructed and then eventually utilized in World War II. But uh, that idea of, you know, keeping things secret and close to your chest. Paul is saying, I I've learned a secret, but I'm not going to keep it to myself. I want to share it with you. 
I want to share it with everyone. I want to share it with the world. And that's the same hope and the same ambition that I have this morning. I've learned the secret. Now, I'm not saying I've learned it to the degree that Paul has. But I can tell you that there have been enough times in my life over the course of it and even as of late where uh, these words have become all the more meaningful. I can do all things through Christ. It doesn't mean the pain's uh, automatically eliminated. It doesn't mean the struggle uh, is eased instantaneously. It doesn't mean that, you know, one day things are bad and the next day they're automatically back to what we call normal, whatever normal is. That's, that's not what he's saying at all. But he's saying with the help of Jesus, with his assistance, I can have strength to meet life and do as God would have me to do and live as he would have me to live. This, uh, this morning, the greatest secret is Jesus died for your sins and offers you forgiveness of them. He offers you life. The greatest gift that could ever be given in not just uh, life here, but eternal life. And that forgiveness that he offers, he offers through his blood, through his sacrifice on the cross in your place. But you have to receive it. You have to receive it on the terms by which he offers it. Hearing and believing God's word, the gospel is necessary. That Jesus is the son of God. Turning your life and will over to Him, that's what repentance means. It's really this idea that's included in this idea of self-sufficient, that I'm going to say, no longer me, God, but you. you. You be in charge of my life. I'm going to repent. I'm going to find strength in living as you want me to live. And then I'm going to, conf to confess. I'm going to make uh, that statement, whether verbally and also by the way that I live, from this point onward, to anyone and to everyone who will hear me, that I believe Jesus is the Son of God and He's the one that gives me power. I'll live accordingly. And then to become a Christian, I have to die to something and I have to be born to something. I die to sin and I'm born to life. I do that in baptism. I do that when I'm immersed in water. A strange command that many people say, well, I don't see any point in that. The point is, that's what Jesus said to do. And so that's enough for me to say, without Him, we can do nothing. And only in Him is every spiritual blessing found, Ephesians chapter 1. And so and to get into Christ, I'm baptized into His death, raised in His life just as He was from the grave on that first Sunday following His death on Friday. Have you done that? Many have in this audience, and we rejoice that you have. Uh, even one this past Wednesday night, we rejoice with her. But now living this new life, have you somehow along the way maybe taken the self-sufficiency that you had in Christ and maybe set it aside? Or maybe said, you know, well, maybe, Lord, I can handle this a little bit on my own. If you made a mess of things, we could probably all hold our hands up in agreement and say, yeah, I've done that before. And it may be in one of those messes right now that you find yourself. It may be that you see sin in your life by choosing to be self-sufficient instead of relying upon Jesus. It may be that you just need strength. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. Sometimes we just need to pray and hug each other and tell each other that and say, I'm there to help you. And Jesus is there to help us all. And so maybe those needs are yours or otherwise, whatever they may be. Paul said, with Jesus, with Jesus we can. With Jesus, uh, we can make it. Without Him, we can do nothing. If you need Him in your life this morning, we've told you how to do that. Please make that desire known to us. Come if you will while we stand and while we sing together.